Hey there, friends, and welcome to another update on the geologic situation that's taking place in Iceland on the Reykjanes Peninsula. I am geology professor Sean Wilsey. Today is Friday, March 21st, and with our family leaving out of town tomorrow for a spring break trip to southern Utah, I thought I would jump on and share with you some information. There's a new Met Office update. Just put together a regular update for today. And if anything transpires over the next week or so, I will do my best to jump on and either live stream or provide some sort of analysis and update. Obviously, there's lots of folks that have been waiting and watching uh, with bated breath to see what's going to happen next and where the eruption is going to be. Um, you know, how long will the fissure be? How much magma is actually going to erupt at the surface? These are all variables that are uh, really impossible to quantify exactly. Uh, but there's a view right now, and it looks like a nice day on the Reykjanes Peninsula of the Sunukur uh, Crater Row and some of the outgassing and uh, water vapor that's coming out of that area. Um, and we're really at sort of the calm before the storm right here. So I thought what we would do here today is start with the data, and then at the end I want to get to the Met Office update because it's it's actually pretty lengthy. Maybe the the folks at the Met Office are... Uh, that you know, as they're waiting for this eruption like we are, they've got a little more time on their hands, and um, they put together a nice detailed analysis that doesn't even that doesn't necessarily look just at the this next eruptive event, but actually looks a bit into the future and some of the uncertainties and some of the possible scenarios that might play out there. So of course, we've been looking mainly to see what might happen with earthquakes. We know that as the pressure has built up in this magma storage system, and the GPS is sort of slowing down in terms of showing that uplifting signal. Uh, this this is a balloon essentially a, a pretty much as full as we think it can get. And now we're just waiting for it to burst. And so the earthquakes will be the most likely signal. But we might see them um, coming in in a very short window of time. Uh, but we expect them to be clustered around the area where the vent will open up as that magma works its way up through cracks and whatever space it can find and starts to widen those cracks and break rocks, that's what's going to actually uh, produce those earthquakes. We don't expect the earthquakes to be necessarily large. We don't even expect them to necessarily be felt, but we should see some clustered seismic activity both in time and space in the definitely the minutes and maybe even hours preceding the eruption. With the November eruption, we saw a pretty short window of time. It was, you know, like a 30, 40 minute run up between when that earthquake series began and when the eruption actually took place. So looking at the last 24 hours, you can see uh, the data here, not much to look at. In fact, if we take out those negative magnitude earthquakes and just look at the slightly larger ones, not much there. Um, you know, maybe eight or so earthquakes around the, the area near the vent that we expect to show the earthquakes. This of course is for 24 hours. I've been playing with the time component over the last few days, just sitting in my office and, um, you know, if I'm checking back quite regularly, sometimes I'm setting it for like two hours because what I want to see is I want to see a quick run up of those earthquakes over a short period of time. And so if you're checking the data pretty, pretty regularly, you might opt for a shorter time range here. Um, you know, sometimes I'm even like I'm sitting in my office with this just up on one of my monitors. I even have it sometimes set for like an hour or less. But the point here is that we're just not seeing yet the seismic uh, signal that would indicate that an eruption is about to begin anytime soon. Looking at the past week or so at the earthquake data, I think what the the last week week's worth of earthquakes does is it nicely shows the area that we expect the eruption to take place. So you can see this clustering of earthquakes uh, just east of Selingerfelt, the Blue Lagoons over here and the power plant. So just tucked to the east of this hill is this fairly nice cluster of quakes. Now the different colors represent when they've taken place. They have not occurred like at the same time. They, these are all spread out over a week. Um, the size of the circle indicates their magnitude. For example, this one here is a 1.3. But just given the data and what we have going on here, I think that's the most likely location. And that's what the Met Office and others have been saying all along as well. They are most likely to see this be the zone where the earthquake starts. Now, once the vent opens up and that fissure exploits the structures and the cracks and the fractures in the rock and starts to exploit that and that fissure 
opens up like a zipper to the northeast and the southwest. Uh, it's anyone's guess exactly how long it will be in any given direction. Uh, will it be uniform with the vent opening here and maybe a kilometer long fissure to the north and a kilometer long fissure to the south? Those are things we just can't answer right now, but this is the place to look for for the eruption to begin possibly. Now it is still possible that the eruption could begin elsewhere along this, this structural lineament here, um, but we expect to see the seismic noise that would go with that. So if it's going to erupt further to the southwest, uh, we would expect to see a clustering of earthquakes there. If it's gonna be further to the north, we'd expect to see that there. And in previous updates, I've kind of walked you through that, shown you what the November uh, earthquake series and the August series looked like, because those did show, especially the August one, I believe, that was one further north that did show uh, a lot of earthquake activity uh, further up in this region here. So again, pretty quiet on the earthquake front, but a week's worth of data does somewhat show the location where we're likely to see the vent opening up. Looking at the GPS data, um, not a whole lot new to report here. Here's our Svartsangi GPS station. So we've been steadily accumulating magma in the subsurface for the past, uh, what, three to four months or so. And the GPS sensors on the surface have recorded uh, steady, but somewhat incremental over, over short periods of time, but over the long term, fairly steady uplift as the ground is swelling and inflating in response to that magma being injected into the subsurface. So the last few days or so worth of data, you can see there's sort of a, it's slowing down a little bit, but there's still a slight upward trend to the data. So it does look like that magma is still pushing into the rocks, but the rocks are probably near their breaking point at, at this stage. They're, they're, they, they've stretched as much as they can stretch elastically um, and we think they're pretty much at capacity, and that's why we're waiting for this eruption uh, to take place virtually at any moment. Uh, the weather in Iceland's had snow on and off, as you can see with the webcam. This, the snow's kind of melted out as things have warmed up a little bit. And so the INSAR data is a little spotty overall, but you can see with this pass here from March 4th to 20th, you can see a bit of the bullseye pattern here, the concentric rings that also... Uh, supports the GPS data in showing where the uplift is taking place and where the inflation is going on above the magma zone. So remember that the location of our vents is a little bit east of the location where the magma storage zone is. So there's some sort of conduit system that carries the magma out of this storage zone here underneath the power plant in the Blue Lagoon and then carries it over to the east where it erupts out of some of those vents there. Um, and you can also see in this one here, it's a little small, it's a little speck there, but you can see the little bullseye pattern there on this more zoomed out view showing the Reykjanes Peninsula. And this pass here goes from March 6th to March 18th. I think that was the only one, the only two I really saw uh, that were super instructive for that area. Um, yeah, similar one down here, March 4th to March 16th, you can still see the, the trend there. So there's our data as it stands. Uh, let's, let me go ahead and walk you through this latest Met Office update that just came out today, March 21st. Um, so th they mainly talk about looking forward. So based on monitoring data, everything indicates a volume of magma that's now accumulated Svartsangi will eventually build up enough trigger pressure to trigger a new magma flow and even an eruption. I uh, realize I'm working off the Icelandic update with it google translated to english last time i checked as of this recording they hadn't put this in english uh, yet um so then they talk about you know possible developments in the coming months um it's assumed that we'll get in a the magma will continue accumulating after this next eruption i would agree with that there is obviously good evidence that the magma influx into the storage system has slowed down a little bit as evidence with the gps trend and the the length of time between each eruption. Um, so they mentioned here two factors are important, how much volume of magma uh, will move from the magma accumulation area for each eruption and how fast magma flows from depth into the magma accumulation area. So how much is coming from the deeper source up into that magma accumulation zone. Uh, the little graph they have here um, shows, let's see if I can get this right, let's go back here. So blue bars are the days uh, since the last eruption, yeah, run up to eruptions, and the volume is the 
orange bars. So the orange bars is the volume in um, how many million cubic meters actually was erupted. That's their estimate of how much volume of lava erupted. And again, the blue is the day. So if I kind of go back to this one, hope you can see that pretty well. Um, how many days since the, the previous uh, magma accumulation event? And you can see it was fairly short uh, this time last year, but it has been lengthening. So as you go from the March eruption to the next eruption, the fifth one, the sixth one, the seventh one, and now we're waiting on this eighth eruption. But you can see the overall trend of these blue bars is more time to accumulate magma between each eruptive episode. The other thing we can see looking at the orange bars uh, is there is a general trend here in that the eruptions that have taken place the most recently have erupted more magma with the one on August 22nd, that began on August 22nd, having erupted the most magma, something north of 60 million cubic meters of magma. And so interesting trends there that we seem to be taking more time between eruptive phases um, and, but then also, um, you know, more magma in storage and more magma actually erupting out onto the ground. Uh, continuing on with the update, and I, I'm not sure how much of this I'm going to cover because actually, again, it's quite a, it's quite a lot of, uh, discussion here in text. Um, let's see if the trend of gradually slowing magma accumulates, accumulation continues, it will take increasingly longer to accumulate the magma. Beneath Fart saying then is thought to be needed to trigger a new magma flow and even an eruption. Um, so when the rate of magma is slow, it has two consequences, and we kind of covered this in the graph, but let's see what they put here. Many months, even years can pass before enough magma is accumulated to trigger a new eruption. The slower the magma accumulation, the more difficult it is to estimate the timing of the next eruption with an accuracy greater than a few months, or whether it will erupt again at all. So the big problem here is, you know, as, as we have more time and the magma accumulation is slower, is it's getting harder to sort of predict because that upward trend is so slow and it's not as steep when you know forecasting that window when we might see an eruption it gets trickier trickier um let's see um nothing in the data uh to exclude the possibility that the rate of magma accumulation under spark singing will increase again in the future so we're not expecting things to tick up at least based on the data and what we have going on right now. That could happen long-term, but nothing probably in the short-term. And then they have an interesting comparison to the Krapa eruptions, which occurred from 1975 to 1984. This was in Northern Iceland, and they did see somewhat of a similar trend. Uh, this is uplift here. And if you look at, you know, the, the uplift after each eruption, so each downdrop is an eruption, and then it inflates again, eruption, inflation. But if you look at the long-term, by the time you get a good five, six years into this eruptive phase, you can see that the, the the slope of this red line, the trend upwards, the inflation rate was a lot more measured and slow. And then they had their last eruption here uh, in 1984. So the red uh, bars up here in this graph are eruptions and the black ones I think are intrusions, if I remember correctly. Um, so interesting comparison there, and you know it is possible that that is probably a good analog for what we're seeing on the Reykjanes Peninsula. Um, yeah, and then there's a nice big paragraph here. You know they just talk about you know we can. It's hard to make predictions. It is interesting to note that you know we've we've seen the both in the prehistoric phase on the Reykjanes Peninsula, and over the last five four or five years or so that eruptions can shift between volcanic systems. We started out in 2021 with the Fagradalsfjallt eruptions that lasted for about two years. Then it shifted over to this Svartsengi system, the current location where we're seeing the eruption now. And so it is possible that things might wind down on this system and we might see things start to pick up on another one. Um, and so hard to tell, lots of... Um, moving parts here, but I think that's what keeps it interesting and that's what keeps us uh, engaged as scientists and citizen scientists is kind of just following the trend and seeing what we can learn from it as well. Uh, they do have a link. There's a link back here going back to the top where it says, here's a link to a summary of what to expect in the next eruption. And they go over the hazard areas and they also go over um, sort of the locations, what, what the main dangers of an event would be in the place we expect it to erupt is the, the fissure opening could be a very rapid process with the fissure extending several kilometers in less than an hour. Um, 
fissures could be as long as six kilometers and continued propagation of fissures could last anywhere from 40 minutes to seven hours. Uh, lava flows are obviously the big hazard that we're looking at here and lava could reach the road to the west of the expected vent area and the power plant area within an hour or so. Uh, gas pollution, that will depend depend largely on the wind direction, but we know if the, the wind is carrying out of the south, it might carry that that gas and those sulfuric gases into populated areas. It could also blow out of the north and carry it into uh, Grindavik. And minor explosive activity, if we do get lava interacting with water, either at the surface or with groundwater, that would be something that we might see. And we have seen that with briefly and localized with some of the prior eruptions as well. So they do run through some of the different hazards here. Um, I'll put links to these in the description and you can check these out as well. But for now, I think as it is for the time being, I think uh, watching the webcam from time to time, checking the earthquake data, and I'm not sure how much lag there is on the earthquake data. Hopefully it's fairly up to date. I don't think it's any slower than you know, maybe five or so minutes, maybe five to 10 minutes. Uh, these will be the places to look to see when this eruption actually begins. So for now, just kind of enjoy um, the data as it comes in. Um, you know, we'll just kind of see where this thing goes. I think we're all expecting an eruption. There's been various predictions made by others, um, but the reality is we can forecast eruptions. We can sometimes look at windows and probabilities but we can't say for sure a date, a time, the location, perhaps the, the magnitude or size of the eruption. Some of those nitpicky details just can't be quantified with the tools we have right now, but we can certainly forecast it. And that's been done. And I think the Met Office has done a, a great job of forecasting and getting information out about the hazards um, and the locations and some of the details as best they can. But for now, we'll just kind of wait and see. Uh, obviously, for the sake of Grindavik and the infrastructure at the power plant in the Blue Lagoon, we'll hope for an eruption. Um, even if it begins east of Seelingerfeld, we're going to hope for, uh, you know, maybe a northward propagation of that fissure. Or even if the vent opens up further to the north, that would be great because there's lots of space out here for that lava to flow into uh, and inundate. And so that would be best is if we could keep the eruption from directing lava to the south in any large degree or to the west in any large degree. But I'll be watching this as best I can over the next week, along with many of you folks. Uh, if you Obviously, if you hear of anything, um, if you shoot me an email, if it doesn't look like I've, I've noticed anything big that's going on, shoot me an email. I'll try to get back to it and try to provide any update and information and analysis as best I can. But for now, uh, be well, have a great day, and we'll see you next time. Take care.